All right. Really glad um, everybody could make it this evening as we kind of uh, meet together and uh, meet online. A couple of announcements I want to make uh, everybody aware of um, the cancellations that have, uh, have happened. Um, and no, uh, no Sunday school for April, no men's meeting um, next week. So kind of keep that, kind of keep that in mind. And um, Thursday evenings, midweek, and uh, Sunday evenings will be uh, online, um, much like we're doing them uh, this evening. First things I want to do is um, go through our uh, prayer list and traditionally our uh, last Sunday of the month is uh, Mission of the Month. And Mission of the Month we've been praying about is uh, Belarus, which really is uh, direct connect. And what we've often done is taken up uh, money to help offset some of the travel that I've done to Belarus. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit uh, about that after our prayer time. But when you look at your Thanksgivings, You've got the Bible studies, Shelley, and Barb's doing better, um, Harvey Clawson, uh, um, Easton, Arthur's uh, nephew. Um, the work here at the building, uh, Bill's done a tremendous job on the floors. Um, Adam's uh, painted uh, in the uh, uh, assembly area here, all these things that are are getting done with that extra time. The sound room crew, the uh, technical advances that are being made to be able to, to do these uh, 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 live broadcasts and uh, the work that um, they're doing with uh, Zoom um, on, uh, with Lima and with the uh, um, uh, Friday Night Fellowships. I'm really grateful and thankful for all that. Um, thankful for uh, the uh, for Robert and Ashley. Um, continue to uh, pray for our nation. Pray for this uh, this virus that uh, God would use it to open people's hearts and minds. Um, pray that God would um, intervene and that He would be with uh, uh, those who are. Um, on the forefront of, of research, developing um, perhaps a vaccine, uh, some sort of, a, of a, a treatment uh, for this virus. Uh, pray for our economy, pray for our leaders, um, uh, pray for your friends and neighbors. So uh, keep the health care workers. Um, Louise uh, has had some uh, difficulty. She uh, covering from a fall. Um, Millie's family. Uh, their uh, housing situation, Tom and Connie, um, both, uh, both of their health uh, have not been uh, real good here uh, for a while. Uh, Jones family, Webeck family, uh, loss of uh, Bob, uh, Billy Waddington and uh, his family. And keep Janelle uh, in your prayers, her pregnancy. Uh, keep, uh, uh, keep Nancy in your prayers as Nancy's uh, in the nursing home and it's kind of a kind of a situation where she can't, um, you know, have visitors even within the nursing home. She has to go to somebody's door and kind of keep that that uh, social distance now. So keep all the folks in the nursing home and the staff at, uh, uh, in in the nursing home. I just saw on TV uh, uh, this afternoon. I believe it was in uh, Maryland uh, where there was a, a nursing home with several. Uh, several cases of the uh, coronavirus. So you know, keep those people who are in those long-term care facilities in your prayers. And you see the continuing to pray for, uh, continue to pray for them. And I would, I would encourage you, especially as the next, next few weeks uh, unfold and maybe you're not uh, working and you've got more time, uh, don't don't come out of these two weeks in the same way that you went into them. You know, really, uh, really uh, practice the prayer. Uh, spend some time uh, in prayer. And I think that's one of the most constructive uses that we can have um, of our time uh, while, we're, uh, while we're 
trusting God uh, to get through this. So, let's pray. Father, it's, uh, it is a privilege, Lord God, to be able to come before you and to know, Father, you can hear us, and uh, Father, you acknowledge us when we pray. And when your children call, you incline your ear. Uh, Father, you are well aware of the worldwide situation with this uh, virus. And Father, you're well aware of your church, your people. And Father, we're well aware that you're on the throne. Now, God, I just pray that you would, Father, for people's health, that this, this virus would somehow burn itself out, that you would be with those who are looking for you know, antidotes, who are looking for vaccines, who are on the forefront of doing research on this, that you would be with them. Father, reveal to them uh, how to get in, in front of this thing. And Father, pray that you would help our leaders and our nation to make good decisions about our economy and how this is affecting, uh, Father, our, uh, our lives, our, our, um, Father, our, our quality of life, uh, and God, the, the general uncertainty that this, uh, this whole uh, virus brings with it. And Father, I know that we can have certainty in you as uncertain as things of this world seems. And Father, it just uh, brings uh, to mind a truth that we acknowledge. But Father, sometimes we acknowledge it with our tongues and uh, it kind of stops there that, Father, all this is temporary, and we look around, it's, it's all going to burn. Uh, Father, our hope, our treasure is in you. But Lord God, while we're here, we want to be effective stewards of what you've given us. So I pray that you would help us to, to be a comfort, to be a balm, uh, Father, to be the, the people who are willing to look to you, who don't, who don't panic, uh, but Father, who react uh, appropriately, who take uh, precautions. But I just uh, ask and pray that as we uh, think about these things, that it would uh, heighten our awareness to the needs that, Father, that others might have, uh, as we uh, go through this, this time of, uh, Father, uncertainty. And I do pray for those uh, who are confined. Uh, Father Nancy, is, she's in the nursing home, and all those in the nursing home, and the aides and the nurses. Uh, Father, the doctors that tend to folks who uh, need long-term care. Uh, Father, those who are kind of staying at home, uh, Father, using uh, caution, uh, Father, those who are mm, at risk, mm, the compromised, the uh, elderly, and those among our, our, our number. And I pray, Father, that as we make uh, decisions about whether we bring the, the family together and, uh, Father, whether we uh, continue to uh, suspend uh, until we get the uh, and get a clear view of, of what this virus is going to do. I pray, Father, that you would give uh, uh, leadership of the churches uh, wisdom uh, and give the government officials wisdom, uh, Father, that we might uh, be able to, to have this thing, uh, Father, to always uh, uh, point to you. Uh, Father, not just in times of, of unsteady and unstable, but uh, God, sometimes I think it's going to take this to to bring people to that understanding and help us to be the people, to, uh, to be your hands and to be your feet in this. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Uh, amen. I want to encourage uh, people who are watching to kind of 
maybe stop this to uh, do some singing. I'm going to spare you uh, to uh, uh, not do any, uh, not just try and lead any singing, but if you uh, in your groups would like to uh, lead your uh, family in some singing, I would, uh, I would encourage that. Uh, but that being said, I want to move um, into the into the Lord's Supper this evening. And, you know, the, the great thing about this is that uh, we can uh, participate uh, together as the, the, the body of Christ, electronically, uh, but metaphysically, you know, with the body of Christ worldwide, uh, participating in you know, what was, was well brought out this morning, uh, this, uh, this memorial, uh, these, these stones that are, are stacked uh, beyond the Jordan. Uh, so that when, you're, when your children ask you, well, well why are we doing this? Why? You, know, you can tell them about the deliverance of, of the Lord. And, and that's what we're uh, talking about is the, the deliverance of the Lord. Now, in, in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place. A higher state of mind and spiritual vision can, can only be achieved through the, the higher practice of personal character. If you live up to the best that you know how, In the outer level of your life, God will continue to say, friend, come up even higher. The, the exercise of our faith. See, there's a, there's a continuing rule, too, in, in temptation that, that, that calls us to go higher. But when we go further, when we go higher in temptation, you know, we... We tend to encounter other temptations and other, other uh, negative character traits. So, this is a strategy of elevation that, that is effective both for good and uh, for evil. See, Satan uses it in temptation. God uses it. You know, the, the, the more you exercise faith, the, the more faith you build. Now... When, when the devil elevates people to a certain place, he causes us to fasten our ideas of, of what is holy, that, that whatever is holy is far above whatever flesh and blood could achieve. See? And, and our lives become a, a spiritual acrobatic performance uh, see, uh, high atop, kind of trying to balance these things. See, we cling to this, this pinnacle, uh, try to maintain our balance, and, and don't dare to move because we're going to, you know, if you don't do anything, you can't do anything wrong. But when God elevates us, when He seats us in the heavenly places, when he invites us to join in this memorial. And he's not coming here to eat with us. He is elevating us there. See, we, we find a, a, a plateau where we can move about with ease. We don't, we don't have to have that, that fear. Am I going to do something wrong? Am I, am I going to, you know, am I going to, uh, violate some, some protocol here. Think about, think about your week, your spiritual life this week compared to your spiritual life this time last year. Think about how, how God has, has brought you to, to see from a higher viewpoint. See, God shows us the truth when you start to instantly 
live up to that truth, applying that truth to our lives, always working through it, always staying in its light. That's, that's the reminder of the blood and, and body of Jesus. It's not, it's not measured by the fact that we haven't turned back, but it's measured by the fact that we have an insight and understanding to where we are spiritually. Now, you might not have heard God say audibly, come up higher, but we can hear it. The innermost part of our character. God asked in Genesis 18, 17, he said, am I going to, should I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? See, God doesn't need to hide what he's doing. You see, waiting on the growth of our personal character. We need to get to the level where Jesus is. And, and then Jesus is going to be able to reveal it. And this, this is our testimony. This is, is our, our, our testimony in, until... Uh, partake of this until he comes again. That I want everything that the body and the blood of Jesus brings into my life, and I can, I can reflect that to others. Let's pray. Fathers, we come together on the first day of the week. Father, specifically to break bread. It's not a sacrament. It's not a, an exercise. It's not a ritual. But Father, it's time for us to come face to face, seated with you, being called each week higher. Father, to, to come up higher, to see things from your level, to... Uh, Father, have those values to be a, a servant, to, to wash feet, to, to be mindful. God, as we take the, the loaf tonight, help us, to, help us to remember that it is with our bodies that we exercise this faith. And Father, it is through the blood and the faith that we have in the miraculous power in the blood. And I pray, Father, that as we participate in this, uh, Lord God, as we come before you with our lives and our testimony, that you would uh, bless this coming week and help us, Father, to be the answer to all the world's problems. Father, because we know that answer is in you. Help us to be salt and light in a city on a hill. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Uh, amen. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm sure you have seen that in the bulletin we had all month, the mission of the month being uh, Belarus. Now, again, I'm going to kind of uh, clarify that, that uh, really it's through 
Direct Connect. I've had an opportunity uh, to go to Belarus several times. But it's not just uh, Belarus. I haven't been able to go I, it's been a little over two years since I've been able to travel to, to Belarus because of health concerns. And one of the things that Direct Connect was able to do in serving as the, uh, um, uh, uh, the president of the board of, of uh, Hands of Grace, and there was a, a fellow coming from the nursing home who uh, liked to participate in our day program. And after the first month, it was found out that their funding would not pay uh, for his stay um, because we were not um, Medicare, Medicaid certified because we're a social model and not a medical model. But he had tried a medical model. He didn't, he didn't fare well there. He wanted to come to the social model. He was doing really good. He's had some developmental disabilities. We were picking him up at the nursing home. And the director called and said, they can't pay the bill. He's not going to be able to come. Long story short, Direct Connect stepped in with money that I had on hand that folks had given me to travel since I wasn't able to travel. And we were able to bridge the gap so that he did uh, eventually re receive funding two days a week uh, to come to our program, and we were able to pick up the rest of that so that he could continue to come. Which, I bring that up because that, that, that is, the, that is the, uh, a great illustration of direct connect. There was a need there. There were some funds there that couldn't be used for travel. And we put those funds towards him being able to, to come to the program, you know, to be able to, to improve his quality of life. So this isn't just simply about the country of Belarus. See, this is, this is about reaching people where they are and, and ministering to needs that... Um, that we as, as Christians become aware of. Everybody but Sam signed up for the, the new company pension plan that called for a small employee contribution, and the company was going to pay the rest. But in order for this to happen, 100% participation was needed. Otherwise, they would not implement the plan. Now, Sam's boss and his fellow co-workers pleaded with Sam to sign the new pension plan, but he wouldn't do it. Finally, the company president calls Sam into the office and says, Sam, Here's a copy of the new pension plan. And here's a pen. I want you to sign the papers. And I'm telling you, Sam, I'm sorry, but if you don't sign it, you're fired. As of right now. Sam quickly grabbed the pen and signed the papers. The boss looked at him and said, Sam, would you mind telling me why you didn't sign up earlier? And Sam simply replied, well, sir, nobody explained it to me quite so clearly before. My point is that motivation is an important tool in life. I'm talking to a man who just had open heart surgery. I knew he smoked. And while we were talking, he told me that he quit smoking. I was surprised. And I said, well, when did you quit smoking? And he said, when he found out that he was going to have open heart surgery. Motivation's a powerful tool. 
What's the motivation for mission of the month? A lot of times it's something like Belarus. We, we think of you know, a mission someplace uh, you know, where you're going to go where they speak a different language and you know, you're going to have, have to wear uncomfortable, weird clothes. And, oh, it's missions. Yeah, but a mission can be sharing our lives and our faith with our next door neighbor. Our mission, in a, in a general term, every month, now, our, our mission, you see, is, is to share Jesus. Now, Jesus gave us our mission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, when he said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, what should our motivation be? Simply, like we talked about this morning, uh, obedience. See, I know a lot of people who, who have certain things they like to achieve, but what is it that will motivate them to do it? What is Christ Church Wasion's motivation to fulfill our mission to introduce others to Christ? Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. Jesus is talking to the 70. And he says to them, that the harvest is indeed large, and the workers are few. And therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest, that he should put forth workers into his harvest. Now by this time, in Jesus' ministry, it was well known of his miracles and his great teaching. In other words, it wasn't hard for Jesus to attract the attention of people or to, to draw a crowd. But he didn't want to just get their attention. He wanted something more. Jesus knew, and it was a lot easier to say all the right religious things and yet not do a whole lot. We are, wherever we are, to prepare people to meet Jesus. But the question is, what's going to motivate us to do that? What's going to motivate us to prepare people to meet Jesus? Well, in Luke 10, 2, the harvest. The harvest is the motivator. Every spring, I used to till up crops before they started just drilling the <laughs> Uh, corn beans in, but every spring the farmers would, would go out and they start tilling up the, the ground and they start planting the crops. They don't just plant. They, they patiently tend, they, they put chemicals on, they weed, they, they, they wait for the big day. They, they wait and they work in the fields so that they'll be ready for the harvest. And when you go out to gather your crops, it's when the crops have matured and they're ready to be brought in. 
In other words, when you cash in all of your hard work for that year, the harvest is the motivator, the harvest is the reason that, that the, the farmer goes out and works the field. It, it's, the, it, it's putting the faith forward. See? Now, when you don't have a mission, when you don't have a harvest, when you don't have a, a goal in mind, you don't know what your purpose is. What crop is the mission of the month going after? What crop is the mission of, of Christ's church in Wauseon? What, what is the crop that, that we're going after? Well, we're, we're going after people. See, we want to invest our time and efforts in sharing with people, the, the power of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, the life that he offers through Jesus to those who exercise faith. When people are touched by Jesus, when people are touched by the body of Christ, they're, they're fertilized with the good news. They'll, they'll, they'll be changed. This is, this is, you know, praying for workers for the harvest. And, and just like when the seed gets a, a proper care and nourishment, then the seed you see, starts to produce. That's what the farmer is after, the, the harvest, the crop, the, the, the production. That's what the mission of the month is, is after. To, to see people become fruitful. And as we participate in that collectively, we share in the harvest. See? Our mission is to see people become what God intends for them to be. And people become more ripe towards the things of God if they see Jesus in us serving. That's why I want to encourage us, especially given this window of opportunity to, to love and care for our neighbors, for each other. Because when, when people see Christians living out our faith, people are more open then to the message of Jesus because they see that it's not just talk. Uh, that it's, it's action. That you know, we can step up and, and help uh, Lenny. You know, we can help the, the fellow. Uh, hands of grace. See? But, but there's a lot of people who don't see the joy in, in being part of the harvest. Uh, one reason, I think, is because we don't, we don't, we don't have... You know, we do, a lot of us don't, don't even go on a harvest anymore. We, we, we go to the grocery store. But for people who are actually doing the picking, the one who's actually involved in the harvest, there's, there's great joy because it's a return on the investment. See, because the person has been able to participate in, in that produce being cared for and nurtured all the way to the table. And... and that person then has a greater appreciation uh, for it uh, than those who don't really have any part in, in that progress. And that's why the tomato uh, that you grow uh, tastes so much better than the, than the same kind of tomato uh, that you can buy in the store. Because you, you have invested in that. 
I, I used to like to fish. I enjoy fishing, but something I enjoy even more is eating the fish. Now, when I bring fish home, guess who enjoys eating the fish more than anybody else? Well, I do. Because I, I have a relationship with the fish that, that we're eating. I, I can tell the story of, uh, of what I went through and catching that fish and where I was when I caught the fish and, and, and I was part of the catch and, and because I had a greater appreciation of the meal, see? Now, that's, a, that's a powerful motivation. And each time I, I catch a fish when I'm fishing, I'm more motivated uh, you know, to, to go back and, and to fish some more. Now, you know, if you know anything about fishing, it's not much fun if you're fishing in a place where there's no fish being caught. I've had plenty of those experiences. And when that happens, I'm, I'm ready to leave. But I'm not ready to quit. I'm just ready to go to a new place and find some fish. And Jesus doesn't have us fishing in a dry spot. He tells us in verse 2 that the harvest is plentiful. That means abundant. It means that there are people surrounding us who are hungry to know God. But the harvest isn't going to happen until God's people are motivated for the harvest. My focus. And the focus I want us here at Christ Church in Wauseon to have is on seeing the most people rescued by Jesus as possible. And that means we're going to have to go fishing. That means we're going to have to invest in this fishing trip. See, if I run into a burning building, I, I don't want to get just one person out. I don't want to get as many people out as possible. And to see the joy on people's faces when they've been rescued is, is really pretty awesome. I, I want to look back uh, and see how people have been impacted by our presence there. And it is our presence. See? Uh, you, you have funded numerous trips uh, for me to, to, to nurture relationships there. But you have, uh, you have financed your own fishing trips. See? Our first motivation for missions is the harvest. Our second motivation for missions is the need for workers. Jesus told the 70 who were going out into the surrounding communities that there was a huge harvest for God waiting, but that the workers were few. There's a huge harvest, but it cannot, it will not be brought in until God's people get involved in the harvest. Now, if God wanted to, he could do all that work by himself. And it's not like he's dependent upon us, but yet he chooses to bless us above all creation to work through us to bring in the harvest. Well, what happens if a harvest isn't brought in? 
what happens if corn crop stays in the field too long. It starts to wither away. It becomes susceptible to animals eating it all up. Romans 10, 14, and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? The harvest is still out there. People are still out there searching and looking for something to fill the void in their lives. We can walk by these people every day, not realizing the potential that God can bring into their lives because they've become part of the Part of the, the woodwork, part of the, part of the framework, part of the things that we pass every day. I read about an experiment. A fellow, a fellow by the name of Gene Wintergarden decided to do an experiment to see if people would recognize the musical greatness when it was right in front of them. Winter Dark Garden did is he got a musician named Joshua Bell to go into the metro in Washington, D.C. And he started, Bell started playing classical music at, at 8 o'clock in the middle of the morning rush hour. And for the next 43 minutes, he played six classical pieces while 1,097 people passed by. Winter Garden wrote, he said, no one knew it, but the fiddler standing against a bare wall outside the metro in an indoor arcade at the top of the escalators was one of the finest classical musicians in the world playing some of the most elegant music ever written on one of the most valuable violins ever made. But on that day, Bell, playing a violin made in the 1600s, valued at over $3.5 million. as just another noisemaker competing for the attention of busy people on their way to work. He ended up collecting $32 when he normally makes over $1,000 a minute for his performances. Now, Jesus said that the workers who bring in the harvest are few. And that's because way too many of us have so many things vying for our attention and we no longer see the harvest before our eyes. It's like when we go to a football game, when we see only the game on the field and not the 80,000 people in the stands who need a savior. Sometimes when we go to work, we see the job before us that day and not the receptionist who is dying for someone that she can share something with so that she can believe in and have hope in. See, having this, even having this time off, my fear is that, that sometimes we're retreating from the world and, and trying to surround ourselves with people who are like us, who, who already have the same faith and the same values as we do. But if this world is going to be transformed, if your neighbors are going to be impacted by Christ, then it's you and me who are going to have to begin looking at them with the eyes of Christ and realize that they're not going to be reached unless we reach them.
Kind of a side note, because I love these people in Belarus. <clears throat> Their response to this coronavirus has been nothing. President Lukashenko has said that people need to go to a sauna, drink a hundred uh, milligrams of vodka, and treat it like it was the flu. I don't know what the end result of that is going to be. We're talking about a country about as big as the state of Kansas, who the countries around them have set up ways to deal uh, with this virus. Um, Belarus is not. That, that concerns me. That concerns me about the people that I know, uh, about the risk. But the, to realize there is a different culture, there is a different people, there, there is a different mindset, and there's, a, there's, a thing, there's things that seem uh, foreign uh, to us. See? So, so our, our motivation is certainly the harvest, uh, to reach people. Our second motivation is the need for workers. And our final motivation is that God will provide us with the ability to win people. Now, while Luke chapter 10 and verse 2 doesn't say that directly, what I want you to think about is that it does say to ask God to send out his workers for the harvest. That's not a suggestion. God's not going to command us to do something that's not going to work. Now, this doesn't mean everybody's going to respond to us. Not everybody responded to Jesus. But there will be some who respond. They're just waiting for somebody to show them the love of Christ and then to point them the way. See? To, to, point them, to point them to Jesus. A lot of times we don't do this because we're afraid, because we feel inadequate, because we don't want to look stupid, we don't want to be rejected. And that's normal. Jesus said, don't, don't worry about what to say or how to say it. See, the ministry of presence, just, just, just be there. Just, just share his personality with others. Now, God will provide for us what to say. He is looking for us to, to be obedient. I read this article about this guy named Norman Gresler. He's a, a Christian writer. I've never read anything, but there's an interesting story of how he said uh, he became a, a follower of Christ. He said he grew up in Warren, Michigan. And his parents weren't churchgoers, but he had a desire to know and to learn about God. So starting at age nine, he rode a bus every Sunday to church until he was 17. Now he figured he rode that church bus over 400 times. And he said it was the same driver every time. After 400 bus trips, he says he became a Christian. And he said, looking back on it, it was the faithfulness of that bus driver to pick him up every week for eight years that was the biggest motivator for him to surrender his life to the leadership of Jesus. And the lesson he said he learned from this was don't give up on people. Don't give up on reaching out to people. It might take 400 bus rides. It might take 400 sermons. It might take 400 meals. It might take 400 texts. 
But it's going to take faithfulness to our mission to reach people for Jesus. So every month, there's a mission of the month. There's a spotlight uh, shown on another mission. But the big mission, the overarching mission, is that people need Jesus. It's going to take faithfulness to our mission to reach people for Jesus. And one of my jobs is to help us not lose sight of what our purpose is. It's to see people come to Jesus. Every way, everything we do is, is pointed in that direction. That's our number one objective, because the fact of the matter is, people can't grow in a relationship with Jesus until they first know Him. And God promises us, if we exercise faith, we will see a harvest. Do not grow weary in doing good. People need the Lord. And as the body of Christ, we have a, a multi-faceted, divine, biblical program to do just that. In Belarus, in Wasion, in the surrounding area. Because people should be able to look at us and see Jesus. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Now, what we usually do is take up an offering for whatever the mission of the month is. Well, if you want to if you want to give something uh, towards uh, uh, travels, I don't know when this will open back up and I can go again, but, but my plan is that as, as soon as it's safe for me to go, as soon as these things open back up, I, I want to go. I wanna, I, I've got folks I want to see. I've got things I want to do. I've got people I want to help. But uh, in the meantime, uh, the communication stays open. I talk to Steve. I talk to people on the ground there. And I'm talking to people in everyday lives. Let's, let's be motivated. And let's pray. Great God in heaven, I am thankful. Father, to be alive at such a time as this, to be in the kingdom, Father, to pray for workers, for the harvest. Father, to ask that you send us, you use us. Father, that we be aware of those around us who, Father, maybe particularly right now have, have needs, have concerns, have, um, Father, unease about the situation. Now, I'm just grateful and thankful, Father, for this body of believers, for their participation in, in the facets of, uh, Father, uh, missions. Now, I'm thankful that we all have an opportunity to be uh, missionaries, uh, whether it's driving the church bus, whether it's uh, being on the cleaning list, whether it's seeing if, if our neighbors need uh, groceries. Now, I just pray, Father, that you would strengthen us, that you would guide us, you would direct us. Uh, Father, that we would be your people in the midst of this generation. Salt, and light, and a city on a hill. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.